This is Weston again with Outworld. It's been a while since we've seen each other, but I've been plotting something special. For the past 15 years, I've worked exclusively on Toyota and Lexus, but I've been a car guy my whole life. There's been one vehicle that's had my attention since the beginning, and building one has been a bucket list item since I first began my 4x4 journey. Let me introduce my latest project, this 2010 Mercedes-Benz G550, more affectionately known as the G-Wagon. Let's get into some background of why I actually chose this vehicle. No doubt, a lot of you are wondering what needs to be modified just to go to the mall. Now, see, that line of thinking is exactly why I chose this project because the truth is the G-Class has one of the richest pedigrees in off-road history with a lineup boasting diversity and capability that's rivaled by very few, if any at all. What you're looking at right now is a 5.5 liter V8, 380 horsepower, solid axle front and rear, and triple locked. A lot of people just see these going in between the mall and Starbucks, and they have no idea every single one on the road is one of the most capable off-road vehicles on the planet. Mercedes-Benz USA positions this as more of a status symbol of a vehicle, trimmed up, low profile wheels, low ground clearance, but very quickly you can fix all of that. So this 2010 is a really great starting platform. As you can see, the previous owner had actually put a two inch lift and 33s on here. All that's getting ripped out. But before I get into detail about what's about to happen to this vehicle, let's go down memory lane and go back to the genesis of the G-Wagon to give you a nice refresher on history. What most know is the G-Wagon is actually short for Galandafagen, which translates to all-terrain vehicle. Created in 1979 at the request of the Shah of Iran for both civilian and non-civilian use, the G-Class has actually never been manufactured by Mercedes-Benz. Magnasteer is the world's largest contract automobile manufacturer. In addition to the G-Class, Magna also produces popular models such as BMW Z4 and even Toyota's latest Supra, with versions including a three-door short wheelbase, convertible cabriolets, and military-style troop carriers, they've created a loadout for every need. In 2001, America gets its first official launch with the W463, retaining all of its off-road prowess while adding a few trimmed up bells and whistles. In 2017, Mercedes doubles down on their off-road domination by releasing the 4x4 Square, an over-engineered masterpiece on portal axles. This led to their development of the civilian 6x6, originally designed for the Austrian military. In 2019, Mercedes released the W463A, which brought the most changes since its inception. Independent front suspension, a larger, more rounded body, and completely overhauled interior. With demand at all-time highs, the G-Class Evolution remains top priority at Mercedes-Benz. With the history lesson complete, it's time to get to the fun stuff. First up, the previous owner used this car as intended, which I love, but the paint has suffered and the interior needs a little bit of love. So let's go back into the detail bay. And for the next two days, we're gonna completely paint correct, recondition this interior and get it back into showroom condition. So we're here for the first step. It's gonna be exterior paint correction, full interior reconditioning. And for all the products, we went with Adams Polishes. They have us covered from start to finish. So we have all of the uh, exterior wash, including the foam cannon, uh, all the detail spray, interior spray, plastic trim, renewal uh, treatment. We've got the polisher, the Swirl Killer Mini uh, SK Pro, an assortment of pads. We've got brushes for the exterior wheels, interior trim pieces. And then to help me out, I have Addison at AWL Detailing. Hey. And then we're gonna be tackling this thing together over the next two days. And I'm gonna show you what the paint is looking like right now. It's kind of rough, uh, but it's got a lot of life left. So we're about to bring that back. Can't wait to show you the process. First up, an undercarriage pressure spray before moving on to the body. To kick things off, we're laying down a nice foam cannon wash. These things are just so satisfying to use and it really eliminates any question on missed spots. 
We're hitting this with a clay bar next, and any silt or dirt left on the paint will do nothing but cause more work ahead. Next up is the iron removal spray, which helps loosen up iron oxide particles before the next steps. This is another easily verified step as the runoff turns purple if and when it grabs those contaminants. With the top layer contaminants removed, the real work ahead is finally revealed. While Addison preps for the long, long step of compound and polish, I'm making some aesthetic changes. First is changing those dated halogen taillights for some fresh LEDs courtesy of Jack Wagon Overlanding. The next, swapping out the front blinker housings to classic amber. Compound and polishing are going to take roughly five to six hours each, and since these are both very repetitive steps, you'll get the gist of what's involved pretty quickly. There's a certain zen to detailing, the ability to witness immediate results, immediate satisfaction. And even for an individual panel, watching it improve over each step, the gratification is quite hard to match. With the polish out of the way, it's time to remove the masking tape and get ready for a hand application of wax. This is the final step to ensure Addison's hard work sticks around for a bit. The interior was in much better shape, so a quick leather conditioning and carpet cleaning wraps up step one with ease. and interior reconditioning done. Uh, we progressed a little bit with the cameras off, I apologize, but I wanna highlight three or four very specific things in the next, next phase of this build. It's the camping and remote work capability, which is essential for me being able to work out of this out of extended periods. So three things I wanna tackle first. First is gonna be the rooftop tent. I went with Auto Homes Columbus variant in size medium. The rack is a Gobi rack. If you've followed my builds in the last decade, you know that that is uh, the only rack I've used on any of my projects and it continues to shine on this project. And with that, we've got the ARV awning, uh, the fridge in the back, which I'll show shortly. And most importantly, especially when it comes to remote work, is the Goal Zero Yeti 1500X mobile lithium power station. It has been a savior for me working remote for the last few years, especially during the pandemic, being able to live in the car, work out of national parks. Um, I used to run a dual battery setup. Uh, Goal Zero kind of tempted me away because of how their technology has progressed and because it's an all-in-one system of not only charging and regenerative uh, capability, is also having all the outlets right there in your face uh, and kind of in a one box solution. The best part is it charges while you drive. I'm gonna put a link into my previous video where I go into more detail about the Yeti. So for the rooftop tent, this is actually my third auto home. I went from an originally a Columbus variant in size small on my third gen 4Runner and then when I started the fifth gen 4Runner build, Auto Home had just come out with their Airtop 360. The main differences between the two is, as you'll notice here, this is a clamshell style. So the front stays static, the rear pivots out. If you want to do one latch, these are gas powered shocks so it springs up immediately. All you have to do is unlatch, pop up, you're in your tent for the night. And again, just following my builds from the last decade, you know, I'm a big fan of Gobi. Uh, their function, uh, complementing the factory aesthetic, I think is second to none. The list of accessories that they have in terms of complementing rooftop tents with the awning that you see behind me, uh, I think really just drawing the complete package. The latter is definitely a plus when I was just talking about the rooftop tent. Being able to integrate all those into one package is very crucial for me. I want to, obviously I like nice things, but I also want them to work quickly. I want them to be efficient, especially if I'm picking up and moving camp pretty often. 
And as you'll see in the tailgate, this is kind of a unfinished solution right now. It's just the goal zero on one side and then my ARB zero fridge on the left. I'm developing a more permanent solution that you'll see here in the near future. But for right now, this is gonna tackle all my needs, uh, especially when we go to Moab next week for a nice shakedown run. Now that the camping and remote work capabilities are taken care of, it's time for the fun stuff. Why don't we go take a look at the suspension wheels and tires on this thing. One of the most intimidating parts of this build was made super easy thanks to Jack at Jack Wagon Overlanding. For the past couple of years, he's been developing a complete four inch suspension system and it's finally out. This kit includes new springs, shocks, steering stabilizer, adjustable pan hard bars, extended brake lines, and caster adjustment bushings. There are a couple shock options to choose from, but I went with Coney and their three inch shock bodies, which are also adjustable. When I started calling shops around Denver, no one wanted anything to do with this truck. Thankfully, I was referred to Austin at True Automotive, and to my surprise, he was excited for the challenge. I put him in touch with Jack at Jack Wagon Overlanding so they could discuss the work ahead in detail. After their chat, they couldn't wait to get their hands on one. It's so refreshing to hear that attitude out of a shop, and seeing them operate over two full days proved I was at the right place. The first few hours were spent understanding the suspension setup, which is actually pretty similar to an 80 series Land Cruiser, and then removing all of the stock equipment. With a healthy bit of persuasion, the freshly assembled trailing arms go back on. Even with the axle at full droop, considerable compression is needed to stuff the new springs onto the perches. And when they're in, finesse comes next to get the spring compressors removed. Then the new shocks are mounted. When you increase a vehicle's suspension height, it moves the axle out of center. The adjustable pan heart allows you to get the axle back to center with ease. Adjustment will happen at the end when the truck goes over to the alignment bay. A benefit of the non-AMG version of these vehicles is a smaller braking system, allowing you to fit smaller wheels, which then allows for higher sidewall protection as well as better air down potential. For this project, I chose Alpha's latest wheel, the Grenade, which offer the best of both worlds. An 18 inch wheel designed for off-road use while having a classy and factory feel. For the tires, I went with General Tires Grabber X3 and 35 by 1250s. Great looking and capable, and one of the best road manners I've ever seen from a mud terrain. These balancing numbers were some of the lowest I've ever seen. After a quick brake bleed, it's time to wrap this thing up over in the alignment bay. The stock audio system was worn and partially inoperable, so this was a perfect excuse for a good overhaul, courtesy of Pioneer. So let's dive right in. PDA Road Gear is among the best audio shops in the region, 
Having worked with Tony twice before, I can't wait for the end results. The great thing about these models is prior to 2013, HVAC is separate from the entertainment center, which allows you to easily keep up to date with the latest audio and dashboard technology. The factory amp is under the driver's seat, so we went with two small format amps, one to power the speakers and another for the sub. Quicker than I'd be able to get the front seats undone, he's already created a custom mounting plate that'll fit perfectly in the stock location. While the panels are off, I've decided to integrate my first dash cam setup, both front and rear. The center channel speaker is located in the middle of the dash, and I've opted to remove that speaker entirely and place the GPS antenna in its place. These doors are pretty thin, so we'll need to install spacer rings so the window can roll down fully. After removing and inspecting the rear 4-inch speakers, we realize they're permanently mounted into the speaker grill. Swapping these out correctly will require some more extensive custom work, in the interest of completing on time, we're gonna revisit these at a later date. Lastly, for a more complete audio experience, I went with Pioneer's low profile 10 inch sub mounted right on the driver rear wheel well. Last but not least, with some EQ mastery from Tony, this thing is finished. We are here in Moab, Utah for the final walk around. It's been a few weeks since most of the work has been done, but I wanted a few hundred miles both on and off road uh, before I felt like I can get some authentic first impressions, as well as I've added a couple things in the last two weeks that I wanted to go over. So let's go through them. The first thing I addressed was my bike storage. So typically without the rooftop tent, I'm putting the bike on top with the Gobi crossbars. With the rooftop tent, I lose that space. And so what I went with, as you see behind me, is a slightly modified Thule top ride. As the name suggests, it usually goes on top of the car, uh, but with uh, some slight modification with grinding off the left side of the top base plate to clear the tailgate, this thing mounts up perfectly. Um, I just came in about 40 miles off road to this spot right here. A pretty rugged terrain. I also did a section of fence and things yesterday. It didn't budge. Uh, it's very easy to take on and off. Just for added protection, because I don't want it falling off on the road, I do use a lock that ties to the ladder. Uh, but after uh, 300 miles so far, I haven't noticed anything. This thing has stayed tight, so I think I'm gonna be good for years to come. The second is a little bit more subtle. Uh, when I filmed the rooftop tent and the awning going on, there was a one inch square tube spacer that I put in between the crossbar and the tent. The reason I did that is on the fifth gen 4Runner, I had the 2000 series awning and there was conflict in between the awning and the rooftop tent sitting together on the Gobi rack. What I didn't realize is the 2500 series black has three mounting tracks running the length of the awning, so you can actually move it up or down. Uh, so I ended up being able to take off the tube spacers in between the crossbar and the tent, and they fit perfectly. So it's just snug right against the rooftop. The last addition was tailgate storage. So thankfully I was able to run by running for tacos just north of Denver before I came to Moab. And I picked up two Wolfpack Pros from Front Runner. 
and uh, they fit perfectly right behind the Goal Zero, just to the right of the ARB fridge. And one of them houses my lighting and recovery, and the other one houses all my kitchen goodies. Um, I'm a sucker for organization. Of course, I'm gonna have stuff outside of those, but to have those two contained in a perfect spot was like icing on the cake for me. With that out of the way, I wanted to share my thoughts on both the end results of this project and the G-Class in general as a potential expedition vehicle. Let's start with some of the drawbacks. Uh, first, out of the gate, these bodies are pretty tall, so relative to some other SUVs and trucks, you're gonna have a higher center of gravity. You start adding weight on top of the roof rack and rooftop tent, that problem is exacerbated. Um, for me, I like a taller vehicle, even if it sacrifices some off-road capability. That's just how I've done my builds traditionally. I think in the future, if I were to go uh, on a more advanced off-road trail and um, wanted to camp at the same time, I'd probably leave the rooftop tent at home and I would ditch that in favor of the swag. The other elephant in the room is weight and fuel economy. Uh, so at 5,500 pounds, the G-Class 2010 is about a thousand pounds heavier than the fifth gen 4Runner. Of course, I've added a few pounds on top of that at the end of the day. Um, out of the gate, fuel economy rating here is 15 miles per gallon highway and 11 city. Uh, after about 500 miles so far, I'm eight to 10 city and 11 to 13 on the highway. Other than that, you do have a higher cost of ownership compared to somebody that's come from Toyota for the past 15 years. But I've been doing my research on the G-Class for the past two or three years. And the non-AMG version is a lot easier to maintain and a lot cheaper to maintain than some think. I've read a lot of user stories from other owners across the world and you're frequently seeing uh, over 200,000 with no issues, just with basic maintenance. Of course, the maintenance and the parts associated with that are a little bit higher than the Toyota, but it's not as extreme as some would think. Another cool thing to me is aesthetics wise, because the body has remained unchanged for so long, just a few tweaks can make an older G-Wagon look like a lot newer G-Wagon. And with the help of some universal accessories like wheels and audio system, you can get this thing elevated into a lot newer vehicle for a fraction of the cost of that newer vehicle. Ultimately, I see a really good opportunity for these moving forward uh, because they're positioned as status symbols here in the States. Everybody wants the latest and greatest, and I feel like the older models like this 2010 are kind of abandoned in a way, and they're not subject to the same markup as these newer 2019s plus. I think the difference maker is gonna be domestic support. So people like Gobi Racks, Jack Wagon Overlanding, Alpha Wheels actually providing customer service and products here in the States, I think takes a lot of the intimidation factor out because you're not having to wonder who you're gonna get in contact with Europe should something go wrong. I think the last bit is also just uh, not a central location for information and hopefully I'm helping a little bit with that uh, throughout the process. But for instance, the audio system, places like Crutchfield that I've relied on for past builds, they have no information on these. So I've had to do manual digging, calling other shops that have done custom work on these. Uh, so I think eventually with that domestic uh, aftermarket support, as well as a bigger domestic community outlining and detailing those things, I think it'll make it a lot more approachable for a vehicle like this to take on the trails. Ultimately, I'm super happy with this build. As a Toyota fanboy for the last 15 years, Toyota definitely gets the edge on reliability, ease of maintenance. Uh, but I don't think these should be overlooked. I'm probably gonna put it more towards a Defender style owner. It's a little bit more of a niche market. And like the Defender, the G-Class is an experience in its own way. So from opening and closing and locking the doors, the sound of that German V8, the tall windows that allow you to see everything out of the cab, the tall seating position, there really isn't another vehicle like it. Other than that, that's it. I'm about to go hit the trails with Rufus again, but this has been an absolute blast to build this vehicle. It's been a pleasure documenting it. I hope you got a lot of value out of this, and uh, hopefully when you're in the market for your next vehicle, maybe you'll give these another shot. As always, leave comments uh, questions in there. I'll be checking them every day, so I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, and hopefully I'll see you on the trails with this big German toaster behind me. Take care.